Beloved, our text for meditation this morning is taken from our gospel lesson, Matthew 14, beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to, his, to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is our text for meditation. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Beloved, today's text is a familiar text. It is the feeding of the 5,000. The lesson given to us by our Lord and Savior contained in all four Gospels. This must be of some significance. For years we have heard this text about Jesus breaking the bread and the fish and giving it to the disciples to give to people. We've heard about the massive crowds that have gathered. But as I consider the context of the society in which we live, I wonder, I wonder, is there a word from the Lord today? Is there something that I can hang my flesh on? Because truth be told, how many times can you tell me about the world's largest fish fry? I get it, Pastor. Let's go, right? I heard this. I know this. And I know it well. But I think today, as we consider the lives we live, the trauma in which we experience, I wonder if God is speaking to us today. And so join me in verse 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot to the towns. When Jesus heard this, when Jesus heard, and if you were following along in your bulletin, when Jesus heard about John in Matthew chapter 14, if we step back a few verses, I just want to bring that to you. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 10 through 12, it talks about what Herod did to John. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. This is John the Baptist. This is John who after four ye 400 years of canonical silence, from the end of the Old Testament to the New Testament, this is John the Baptist, the one who God desired to use to speak a word from God after God had been silent for 400 years. This is John the Baptist. This is John the Baptist who baptized Jesus. Oh, we're not talking about some relative we got together for some macaroni and cheese for a family reunion. This is somebody special. This is, as some theologians might suggest, Jesus' first miracle. Because some believe that when Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, John may have been stillborn, and that's why when Jesus showed up, he leaps in the womb because she was experiencing no movement. His cousin has just been beheaded, and he now has word. What do you do when you experience some pain? When you experience some news that you otherwise would not want to hear, Jesus teaches us something in a today kind of context. Did you hear what he did? 
He got in a boat and went to a desolate place. You might want to mark that word. We'll come back to that later. Do you ever take some time to just get away and refresh yourself? Or do you just try to bear down and, and grin and bear it and deal with the stress that life brings? You see, when you don't take time to get away for a moment for yourself, the stress of life has a tendency to force you to forget who's really in control. Just a word today. Don't be afraid to take a moment for yourself. And trust me, it'll be just a moment because as Jesus steals away to a desolate place, did you hear what happened? The crowds heard that Jesus was leaving and they followed him on foot. You might be in a boat, but we're going to outrun you to where you think you're going. So yeah, yeah, take a moment, take a moment. But understand that I believe that as we read our Bibles, this is the word that God is trying to give us. Because sometimes we get so consumed with that which hurts us, that which bothers us, that you just want to go to a desolate place. You just want to stay in that desolate place. But I stand to tell you today that that desolate place, when you're in the desolate place, perception is everything. But I won't preach that just yet. We'll get there. In verse 14, it says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion on them and healed their sick. Compassion. In translation, it moved him in his inner parts, in his heart, in his liver, in his kidney, in his lungs. The pain that they were experiencing was something that moved him. You identify with somebody else's pain. And by Jesus' actions, he's setting up the context for the miracle that we know as the feeding of the 5,000. He's setting up a word for eternity. Follow this with me. Jesus is in his own pain. His cousin has just died a very brutal death, a very public and brutal death for preaching the word. And so he can identify with pain. And so when he sees people in pain, he's moved. How do you react when people are in pain? Or do you just stay in your desolate place? Do you just sit there and woe is me? Jesus is showing us how to handle our pain. It says he got up and had compassion on them and healed their sick. Jesus' own pain allowed him to address the pain of others in order to advance the kingdom. In verse 15, it says, Now when evening had come, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages to buy food for themselves. Beloved, on the surface, this sounds awfully Christian. The disciples have gone to Jesus, and they said, we're in a desolate place. You got at least 5,000 men, because your text tells us, besides women and children. So let's estimate, pair some folks up and their kids. So you're dealing roughly with about 15,000 people. And the disciples said, Jesus, we're in a desolate place. Oh, there's some things I should probably tell you about this text. You might want to know this. So there are eight miles between where John was and where Jesus went to a desolate place. Now, they don't travel eight miles on foot. And if you read some of the other Gospels, it tells you that they carried some people with them for eight miles. Because healing from Jesus was that important. I told you on the surface, this sounds really Christian. But if you look at the text a little deeper and you begin to hear from Jesus, I don't know how Christian it really was. I think the words from the disciples allow us to find ourselves in this biblical context. Jesus, allow them. You see, it's all in how you say it. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. They didn't just say, Jesus, tell them to get out of here. Allow them to go into the villages and buy something to eat. So let's consider desolate for a moment. Anybody want to talk to me about desolate? What does it mean to be desolate? Nothing else there. Barren, 
laid waste, devastated, treeless, deprived, destitute, solitary, lonely, a desolate place, abandoned by friends, abandoned by hope, dreary, dismal, gloomy. So yeah, 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 it's a, it's, it's a desolate place, geographically, but spiritually he begins to show us they too were in a desolate place. You ever been in a desolate place? You ever been lonely? You ever been dreary, felt like life was just uninhabited? There's no hope. Life has just come in and done some things to you that you didn't even want to happen. Jesus allowed them to go into the villages and buy something to eat. It's amazing when you're in a desolate place, it communicates about your inward parts. Because their suggestion only communicates that they were concerned about self-preservation. You ever been in a desolate place and all you can think about is you. All you can think about is me, me, me in this desolate place. And so I told you on the surface, it sounds Christian, but let's take a look at verses 16 and 17. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Verse 17, they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. I told you, when you're in a desolate place, you're only concerned about self preservations. Oh, darn all this Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 stuff and bear one another's burdens. Ah, you know, that's, that's biblical. That's Sunday morning. But we're in a desolate place. You ever been in a desolate place? You start examining things and looking at things a little differently. I told you they were eight miles away from where they came from. You hear the disciples a little more clearly now. I know you like all this Jesus stuff, but on an eight-mile hike, you didn't think you was going to get hungry. You thought enough to bring somebody. You didn't think enough to bring a sandwich. That is not my problem. You start assessing things a little differently. I said this party was from 2 to 5. Why are you still here at 538? My fault you wanted dinner. I was providing finger food. This was not a meal. I'm not trying to feed you. Don't laugh. You might tell too much about this text. <laughs> and so there they stand. Because when you're in a desolate place, you're only concerned about yourself. They had already examined the situation. God didn't even ask them. Jesus didn't say a word. Let, well, watch this again. Watch that, verse 16 and 17. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. He didn't ask you how much you had. They already assessed the situation. They saw the sun coming down. Their stomach started getting to the back of their spine. Wait a minute. <laughs> we can't feed all these people. But it's right there, dear friends. That's the text. That's the theme for today, right? That's the challenge given to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the lesson. He already set it up for us. His cousin had been beheaded. He went to a desolate place, but in his pain, he was moved to compassion. How do you handle your desolate place? Yeah. Many of us, many of us are walking around waiting for the right conditions to do something. Jesus' challenge to us is use what you have right now. Lord, if I didn't have this anxiety, I would do a little more ministry. If I didn't have these aches and pains, I would do a little more ministry. If I didn't have these conditions, I would do exactly what you want me to do. Lord, if I could just get something a little bit closer to what I wanted, I would serve you a little better. Biblically, I can't let you tell that lie anymore. Jesus is asking you to give them something to eat, to use what it is that you have. Did you hear our Old Testament lesson for today? He said, come to a place where your money is no good. This isn't about spending. This isn't about riches. This isn't about wealth. It's about your availability to use what God has given you. But so often, 
so often we want the conditions to be right, the stage to be a little different. Dear friends, until you operate in the condition in which God has you, your stage won't get any bigger than what it is. To communicate that where you are right now is inadequate communicates that God made a mistake. Who's that bold? God is simply saying, give me what you have and I will take care of the rest. He wants us to understand some things. In the hands of God, there's always enough. Just make yourself available. Your broken places, the things that are disturbed in your life is right where God wants to do ministry. Mess and ministry both begin with M. There's a reason. Those things that are broken in your life are the very things that God wants to use to be a blessing. This theme has been reoccurring all week. And I say it all the time and don't get sick of it. Every blessing you have is connected to a burden. Every answered prayer comes at a cost. I was watching, um, all right, so you'll learn a little more about me. I was watching live with Kelly and Ryan. And they get on there and we going crazy because Halle Berry looks fine at 50. Okay. And so they show this photo of this 50-year-old Halle Berry in a two-piece bikini jumping on the beach. And the woman is saying, how do you do it? You look so good. She says, I'm such and such type of diabetic, I can't have any sugar or starch. And all this lady heard was, you can't have any sugar or starch. Anybody miss this? <laughs> if she eats it, <laughs> the Halle Berry that you're jocking has a problem. But we don't want to talk about that. We just gonna go out here and try to eat no starch and no sugar because we want to look like Halle Berry. She just told you, my blessing has a burden. So I don't want you to think that that's just TV. I'm gonna give you some, some, some live examples and then we're gonna touch some scripture. In 2010, at 424 Indian Wood, I sat with Keisha in the back pew of that sanctuary. And she was crying to me uncontrollably as her pastor. And what we were struggling with was the death of her daughter, Veronica. A pain that I know nothing about. A strength she has I know nothing about. And she kept saying to me, Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And I simply said to her, Keisha, I don't either. But one thing I do know is that out of your pain, God is going to birth a blessing. And she looked at me just as cockeyed and stopped crying. And she said, I can't hear that right now. I said, he will use your pain to be a blessing to somebody else. Can I fast forward you to 2015? And I just want to read a clip of a book that is now on Amazon. A special thanks to Emmanuel Lutheran Church Grief Share Support Ministry. Janice lost her son. And out of Grief Share, yeah, run by Keisha, God birthed this book. And now our ministry is forever connected to her pain, to her blessing her burden. Just this week, I was reminded that we are now dealing with 50 years of ministry of Johnny Erickson. Anybody familiar? Jumped off a diving board at a young age, paralyzed from the neck down. You can hear her on Moody all the time. And she talks openly about how her paralysis has allowed her to see how susceptible to sin she really is and why she needs to cling to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your pain has a purpose. The little bit that you have, the five loaves, the two fish, are enough for God if you would simply use what God has given you where you are right now. We too often operate out of our deficits. We never operate from a position that this is an opportunity. 
So here's our mindset, 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll begin at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, now watch this, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. In verse 11, and she was going to bring it. He called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. When you're in a desolate place, all you can think about is the little bit that you have, and you just want to eat it and die. You don't want to deal with any more of this. This God stuff is too much for you. Did you hear what Elijah told her? He said, bring me a little water and a handful, a morsel, a bread. Now your response to this, my response to this as we consider the text is, that's not my problem. I didn't tell you to come here. I was just gathering my sticks and I was ready to die. I've made peace with my life. Don't ask me for nothing. I'm hurting right now. And Jesus is challenging us today. God is challenging us today that what you have right now is enough. If you would simply use it, he could advance the kingdom. This has absolutely nothing to do with you. We spend too much time. Barry Gordy just uh, sued Michael Jackson's estate. And it got me to thinking about the whiz. Because we spend too much time wanting to ease on down the road, trying to go see the wizard to get a heart, some courage, some strength. We waiting for somebody else to come. And God is telling us in this text, quit using me to do what I've prepared you to do. I know that's hard for us to swallow because we, we have conditioned ourselves to kind of think kind of Christian, take everything to God and he'll work it out. He's entrusted some gifts in you that he wants you to use right now, right in front of you. Many of us are standing in front of our breakthrough but don't want to use the gifts that God has given us because we're waiting for a better tomorrow. You can't ease on down the road. Just use it, and this is what will happen. Follow the text. So now we're back in 1 Kings, right? We're we going to pick this up. So you're not going to die. In verse 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first, now, now wait a minute. He first asked her for a little morsel. Now watch what he's asking her for. Make me a little cake <laughs> and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. It's okay to use it. But until you use it, you will not see how God has equipped you, how God is sustaining you. Quit operating from a place of negativity. With God, this is always an opportunity. Nobody needs to go anywhere. Don't be intimidated by the crowd. Simply make yourself available. Give yourself away so that God can use you. There's no better opportunity than right now. I know you wish, I know I wish, that things could have turned out a little differently, things could be a little better. But this isn't about you and I. This is an opportunity for God to create a miracle. He takes what you has, what you have, and he turns it over to God, and he blesses it, and multitudes are fed. Lives are changed. But when you hold back from God, 
we miss the opportunity for a miracle. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. And there you hear these words. Can, can you read that for us, please? Right there. For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. It could quite possibly be argued theologically the reason things have not changed is because you ain't using what you have. The very thing you praying about is connected to your ability to use it for God. Right as you are. Have compassion. Be moved. God will provide. God will sustain. This has nothing to do with your ability to provide. And everything with God's ability to provide the miracle and advance the kingdom. You've prayed it. We've talked about it. You want his kingdom to come. Guess who is going to come through? Yeah, you and me. The thorn in your flesh, the very thing you wish God would remove, he's not taking away. Life's not going to get better if he removes it. It's just not biblical, and I, that's what you asked me to tell you, the Bible. You can pray all you want. He's not removing the thorn. The thorn should be the motivator for your ministry. Because he says, my grace is sufficient. He will sustain you through the pain. When you are weak, he is strong. By removing the flesh, you would have the mind, I would have the mind to think that it had something to do with us. Ouch. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's desolate. Yes, it's dark. But this is what God wants from the text. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It tells us about God's compassion and what we are supposed to do with this compassion. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, it shares with us that God had compassion on us and we share in his compassion. And the same compassion that we have received from God flows over to others. So that if you participate in his sufferings, you also participate in his compassion. When you see people, don't judge them. I, I, I received an article from a study about the percentage of Christians that believe people are poor because they're lazy. The number of Christians that believe people are poor because they're lazy. What about Matthew 25 says any of that? And if we would simply understand that compassion is a gift from God that we have the sense to recognize that something has moved in us inwardly. I'll break it down for you like this. As you stare at the cross, does something move in you inwardly? Do you understand the compassion that spilled out on each and every one of us as he hung and bled there for your life? As you look at the cross, I mean, we like Ephesians chapter 2, especially verse 8, because it screams out, by grace you have been saved. We love it. Oh, I could just sit here and be lazy. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, as you go through that, it says, for you are God's workmanship. Mm. Right? You are God's workmanship. God has created you to do some things as a reflection of what took place for you and I on the cross. There, there is just no way that you look at the cross and you understand everything that's happened and you don't have compassion on somebody. Okay, so they forgot their sandwich because their physical need was much more than what they thought their spiritual need was. But now that you and I have experienced this grace. Do you not understand that God prepared that for you in advance? The very thing that 
you want to happen is staring you in the face, and God prepared it in advance for you to walk through it because of the cross. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there is no time greater than right now. I know life has dealt us some blows, dealt us some situations. You may even think that time has passed you, and I'm in a different stage in my life. Wherever you are right now are opportunities to provide ministry. And there are some things that God simply wants you to hear this. You give them something to eat. Share the compassion that you have received from Jesus Christ and use what you got. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.